um, so I will try to give you an insight into uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibody CRPs and uh, looking a little bit also into the history and into the future and of course trying to then also finalize with some physical chemical challenges that I'm facing as a formulator in the industry. So I have to show this very slide, not very interesting. So a um, little bit what exactly I will be presenting. So I will be giving you an overview on the antibody therapeutic market. And then also, hopefully this is not what you already know by heart, but how do therapeutic antibodies really work? So what do they induce and what is their mode of action? And then I will elude on the evolution of antibody structures because we are seeing increasingly really crazy structures and the antibody designers are very creative. And then I would like to uh, finalize with how the monoclonal antibodies are really applied to human beings and how they are formulated and conclude. So with that, um, um, yeah, actually here, uh, I have to, I think, go here. Yeah. So um, currently there are 140 therapeutic uh, monoclonal antibody products on global markets. Um, the first monoclonal antibody was generated already in 1975, based on the Nobel winning work of Kohler and Milstein on marine hybridoma technology. And they won the Nobel Prize indeed then in 1984. And the first monoclonal antibody was fully licensed um, in 1986. It was autoclone OKT3 um, for acute uh, transparent rejection. And then the first um, monoclonal antibody approved for oncology patients was then rituximab in 1997. And as of March 2021, 100 therapeutic MAPs are, um, have been approved by the US FDA. And uh, the importance of this class of drugs cannot be overstated. More than 50% of the biologics drugs on the market today are MAPs. And within the biologics or within our um, pro products, the biologics even play a, um, a very significant role, also in terms of finances. So um, the market value of monoclonal antibody CRPs is really substantial. In 2020, 10 out of the 20 best-selling drugs worldwide were antibody or antibody-like molecules. And if you look at the numbers um, behind, so the sales behind, uh, this is quite substantial. Uh, given the relatively high price of MAP projects, um, the indications are rather in the severe fields, like in oncology, so products here are Obdivo, Keytruda, Rituxan, Avastin, or severe autoimmune diseases. So Ocrevos, for instance, for multiple sclerosis, Remicade, Enbrel, Hemira for rheumatic diseases, or Stellara for Morbus Crohn or colitis ulcerosa, or to avoid blindness like Ilea for wet macular degeneration. Um, you may have been wondering um, about the names of the underlying monoclonal antibodies, and I should like you to give you a little bit of a lecture here, Ryan. Um, a fully marine, so mouse antibody would have the suffix MOMA. Um, and if more and more protein sequences have been modified to increase their similarity to antibody variants, um, produced naturally in humans, they would be called Ximab or Tumab. And an antibody with fully human structure is a Umab or Mumab. The reason for trying to get uh, the antibodies humanized or even fully human is um, to reduce immunogenicity. Um, however, since November 2021, a new INN nomenclature scheme has been published, and I must say that I'm really a little bit confused about that. Um, they differentiate in this nom new nomenclature by suffix and infix. So the suffix is determined by the nature of the map, so took, 
stands for an unmodified map and MIG for a multi-specific map and MENT for a fragment. And the infix is determined by the mode of action. So for instance, STO is for immunostimulatory and PRU for immunosuppressive maps. I have given here an example for the new nomenclature. So here, Krexa V BART. And um, uh, V would be for um, a viral um, um, uh, antiviral molecule. Um, and um, BART would be for an antibody which has been generated in artificially or a designed antibody. Um, but to make it more confusing, since old INN names continue to be used, we will have several nomenclatures in parallel in use, which does not ease the understanding. But hopefully next time uh, you read um, about new um, market entries, you will remind a little bit um, uh, these rules. Okay, so next is how do therapeutic antibody work? And here, um, a quite illustrative picture to understand the complexity of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies, a comparison between the well-known aspirin. So acetylic, salicylic acid is quite helpful. Not only the size is substantially different, we are also talking here, we are talking here of a difference of 800 times, but also the efficacy is dependent not only on the primary sequence or if you will, a, a center of chirality as typical for small molecules, but on the three dimensional structure and the folding of the monoclonal antibody. So secondary structure, tertiary structure, quaternary structure really make um, um, or trigger the efficacy and the bioactivity. So let us now spend some time on the structural details of a monoclonal antibody and here um, the type IgG. It is composed of two heavy chains and two light chains. Each chain consists of variable and constant regions, sometimes also of a highly hypervariable regions. And uh, they are desulfide or cysteine bridges, both <clears throat> stabilizing via intra-chain bonds, the structure of a chain, and via inter-chain bonds, the whole monoclonal antibody. The Hintz region <clears throat> separates the so-called FAB, FAB, from the FC part. And the FAB part typically contains the domains responsible for the target recognition whereas the FC part comprises carbohydrates and is important for effector functions and for recycling of the maps um, and for tissue distribution. There are various FC gamma receptors that upon binding to FCs of antibodies trigger an immune activation or an immune inhibition. We will have a closer look into this in the subsequent slides. Um, the first example of a therapeutic monoclonal antibody that I would like to present is adalimumab or Humira. The indication are various <coughs> forms of arthritis, spondylitis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, chronic plaque psoriasis. It's a human antibody which binds with specificity to tumor necrosis factor alpha and inhibits its interaction with the P55 and P75 cell surface TNF receptors. Adalimumab also lyses cells expressing tumor necrosis factor on the surface in the presence of complement. And now complement. The complement system is a set of plasma proteins produced in the liver that act together to attack extracellular forms of pathogens, because you, you recall the immune um, defense is essentially targeting at pathogens and not necessarily um, at uh, cells that um, we present in the context of our treatments. The complement activation can occur by antibody binding to the pathogen or other cells marked by the antibody, our therapeutic antibody. 
and leads to the killing of the pathogen or the target cell by formation of a pore and the subsequent lysis of this very cell. Um, another example for an important therapeutic monoclonal antibody is ocrelizumab or ocrebus. The indication is primary progressive or relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis MS. Ocrelizumab is a cytolytic antibody that selectively targets B cells that express the CD20 antigen. And um, it acts via antibody dependent cytotoxicity, so ADCC. ADCC here is enhanced by the so called AFUCO platform which um, at the same time has reduced complement dependent cytotoxic effects. Natural killer cells and K cells recognize these cell bound antibodies via CD16 FC receptor and lead to the apoptosis of the marked cell. Um, yeah, um, ocrelizumab is further a second generation recombinant humanized monoclonal IgG1 antibody and compared to the non-humanized anti, uh, humanized CD20 antibodies such as rituximab, uh, ocrelizumab is affected to be less immunogenic, um, uh, unwanted uh, immunogenic with repeated infusion and improving so thus the benefit to risk profile po for patients with MS who definitely have to take uh, the medication lifelong. So, now, hopefully, you are experts in complement activation and in this ADCC, so antibody-dependent cytotoxicity. And um, uh, with this um, slide, I should like to summarize the antibody effector functions. The therapeutic antibodies may function simply by blocking a ligand or a receptor like the programmed death ligand one or the programmed death one receptor blockers in the checkpoint inhibitor anti-cancer drugs. You may have heard about that already. And um, they may function by this famous complement activation. They may function by antibody dependent cyto cytotoxicity, so CDC and ADCC, or by a combination of both and they may function via triggering phagocytosis by the cells of the innate immune system. So um, that's basically the functionality. And <clears throat> I think you also um, may recognize that not only the binding, but really the FC part of our monoclonal antibody may have a very um, integral um, part in the mode of action. So in some instances, however, we do not want to have antibody effector functionality by the FC part. And then by antibody design, we may modulate or silence and silence this function. Certain mutations or amino acid exchanges will trigger this silencing. One of the most known is the LALA mutation, where leucine and alanine are exchanged in the FC part. Also, via glycoengineering in the FC effector function, um, this um, um, effector, um, um, the effector cell um, can be modified. The um, this mechanism can be modified <clears throat> to uh, give you an example for antibody drug conjugates, um, and I will present the, these later, NFC-dependent effector function is not desired because it would enhance off-target accumulation of the toxin. So, well, um, now the evolution of antibody structures. Um, I would like to familiarize with uh, you with some evolutions that antibody design has enabled. And I can tell you that in the Novartis Biologics early portfolio, we hardly have classical monospecific antibodies or non-designed antibodies anymore. Um, <clears throat> we already heard about the switch <clears throat> from early mouse antibodies to humanized or human antibodies. 
which induce less unwanted immunogenicity. So you see that on the left-hand side of the slide. The predominant antibody subtype used in therapeutics is IgG1. In fewer cases, we have IgG2s and IgG4s. And I'm not really aware of the use of IgG3s. So I have to drink something. Um, quite important <coughs> are the species on the right-hand side, um, antibody fragments. For instance, the FAB2 fragment, also FAB2 antibody, is the antigen binding fragment of an antibody that can be obtained <coughs> by cleavage with the enzyme pepsin. The FAB2 fragment is a protein constructed of two FAB fragments, um, which are held together by disulfide bridges or alternatively by adhesive domains. In contrast to classical full-size antibodies, such as um, immunoglobulin G, FAB2 fragments do not elicit a cytotoxic response via activation of the complement system, which we now are experts on, because they lack large portions of the FC fragment. Um, if then uh, another very important species nowadays are the single chain variable fragments, so SCFV fragments or SCFV antibodies. <clears throat> they are artificially produced antibody fragments that covalently link the antigen recognizing variable domain, domain of the light and heavy chains of a classical antibody. And due to their smaller size, they may also have a different tissue penetration property. So for instance, might be more um, uh, penetrating also into the brain. <coughs> what um, is depicted here is that Antibody engineering really creates much more crazy formats, as you really see with all these um, um, schematics. Building up on the resounding therapeutic success of monoclonal antibodies and supported by accelerating progress in engineering methods, the field of multispecific therapeutic antibodies is growing rapidly. A multivalent, bispecific IgG modified formats predominant today, as I alluded, with a clear tendency for more target um, antigens and further increased valencies in newer constructs. This is augmented by adding additional functionalities by drug conjugation or attaching radioligands to MOPs or fragments. And uh, these developments will be alluded in examples in the next slides. <clears throat> a first generation bispecific antibody, also known at, as, um, as a quadroma, consists of one heavy and one light chain of two different monoclonal antibodies. The two arms of the antibodies are each directed against different antigens. The FC part or the foot of the antibody is formed together from the two heavy chains of the antibodies and represents the third uh, binding site of the bispecific antibody. Um, this structure makes it possible, for example, to place the paratope of an antibody directed against a tumor antigen and the paratope of another antibody directed against a lymphocyte antigen. Each um, one, um, um, uh, one arm of the bispecific, in the, each on one arm of the bispecific antibody. In this example, it is then possible for the antibody to bind to a tumor cell with the corresponding tumor antigen and to a lymphocyte. Antigen presenting cells such as B cells or macrophages can then bind via uh, the FC section of the bispecific antibody and form a three cell complex. This three cell complex uh, usually results in improved activation of the body's own immune cells against the tumor cells. 
However, the production of this kind of bispecifics is not trivial as homodimers, so no longer heterodimers with two binding sites in the FAB region or mispaired antibodies in the FAB region need to be minimized. But there are technologies like here in this case, the NOP and whole formats, um, which have brought some solutions. Um, the bispecific antibodies of newer generations deviate from the previously shown structure. And they can be composed of two uh, single chain variable fragments, so I see a three fragments. Um, this concept is called bite, um, bispecific T cell engager. The first example for such a byte, Lina Tumo map, um, um, was generated by Micromet, um, and later um, Amgen bought this company. Uh, the variable domains, so the VH and VL of a CD19 specific monoclonal antibody with B cell affinity, and a CD3 specific map with T cell affinity were more or less converted here into a single chain antibody. Um, another interesting format are so-called antibody drug conjugates, ADCs. The first generation of these ADCs were using lysines to bind via linkers the toxin. And the toxin was supposed to accumulate via uh, the so-called magic bullet antibody at the target cell and kill the cell in a directed way. In the case of Katsaila, the toxin is called uh, DM1 and is a microtubule inhibitor. Newer developments comprise cleavable linkers, which are cleaved only upon internalization by the target cells and most importantly, target integration of cysteine thiomaps, which enable a more precise DAR. DAR is the drug to antibody ratio um, by the conjugation. So with this targeted integration of, um, of cysteines, um, this ratio um, could be made more precise. And instead of DARS here in this case of Katsaila of zero to seven or on average 3.5, the controllable DARS of exactly two or four are feasible. Also the conjugated toxins are in evolution and um, um, you, uh, there are even uh, attempts to um, exchange um, the toxin by an antibiotic and uh, thus also enable quite toxic antibiotics to be targeted applied. This would be then uh, um, no longer ADCs, but um, antibiotic conjugates or ABCs. <laughs> um, Oh, A -A 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 -C -S, yeah. So uh, with that, I would like to make here a clear cut and also talk about um, challenges that industry and more specific drug product development faces when developing maps. Sorry. Is there something? Okay. <laughs> Um, so it is not only about designing the right um, um, functional molecule, but it should also be stable and very importantly can be applied in a patient friendly manner. Since really non-compliance is one of our major um, uh, challenges in health systems. So with that, I'm showing you here the um, application forms of MAPS, unfortunately, the oral tablet or capsule is still the holy grail. There are attempts, but still uh, antibodies are typically given parenteral, <clears throat> either by infusion or injection. And meanwhile, there are also um, self-injection systems on the market and feasible. Um, this, however, um, due to the fact that we want to be more patient-centric and enhance compliance, um, there is a clear trend towards um, a subcutaneous application, which means that we need to go higher in concentration in order to have in the same 
uh, or have in, in a volume that can be applied subcutaneously the same dose that we have been given before via uh, infusion. And um, yeah, this um, renders these high concentrations bring further challenges. The solubilized proteins are closer together, which promotes protein-protein interaction. And the uh, monoclonal antibody clusters can also form mild to severe turbidity measured by light scattering. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, these um, uh, clusters can also end up in quite viscous formulations, which are then difficult to apply. Um, that's depicted here. And um, ultimately, depending on the antibody viscosities of more than 20 centipores can be uh, rising if we concentrate uh, to 100 mg per milliliter or above. And this, as I said, may hamper the fact uh, the, the syringeability or the application by syringes. And um, yeah, the following image here is intended to illustrate the mechanism um, involved in the aggregation of therapeutic proteins. So it's um, an instability reaction. The proteins can either partially unfold and form clusters or form clusters of refolded protein through these mentioned protein, protein interactions. Um, and in the end, over a cascade process, quite large insoluble and soluble um, agglomerates and aggregates can, can, can be resulting. And the consequences are for sure, not only that we may have a turbid solution, but most importantly is the threat of an immune re reaction. Um, you know, as you recall, uh, the innate um, immune system typically um, fights against pathogens, and if you have aggregates of proteins, they look a little bit like a virus, and then um, the innate immune system of the patient may fight against it and create immune reactions, but also reduce the efficacy of our monoclonals. So this is absolutely to be avoided. Um, as stabilizers, the formulator typically uses surfactants, besides, of course, trying to use an appropriate pH value. And there are more exotic excipients under investigation. Um, I should like to share with you one um, yeah, uncomfortable situation. What is if the stabilizer itself is destabilized? And that's here the case, unfortunately, for our cash cow polysorbates, which we add to prevent the aggregation. And unfortunately, due to um, uh, lipases that may result as host cell proteins um, um, from the drug substance manufacturer, and are not removed during the polishing process. So these lipases may degrade our polysorbate or via oxidation. And then instead of having particles from proteins, we may have particles generated um, from um, the polysorbate. And you can imagine that something like that wouldn't be accepted by the market. So with that, um, I'm at the end of my presentation and I hope that I could give you some insights into industry life and industry research. Um, and as I'd like to summarize that monoclonal antibodies are key modalities to treat unmet medical needs. And um, yeah, the field of antibody engineering um, constantly um, results in evolving um, complex molecules with even more complex physical chemical properties, which we need to understand. And due to the need for highly concentrated formulations, protein um, um, formulators face new challenges. Um, and these uh, new challenges might be um, aggregates leading to immunogenicity. And therefore, it's my mantra that we all should know much more about monoclonal antibodies, not only of the design, but also the physical chemistry in order to enable um, effective um, and patient-friendly monoclonal antibody therapies on the market. 
And with that, I should like to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I have put in here also my contact details. And yeah, with that, um, I don't know whether how much time we have still for the Q&A. <laughs> and um, thank you very much. <laughs>